Hey everyone, we know how hard it can be to keep up with the latest news here in Israel. So if you haven't had the time to stay on top of what's what here in the Holy Land, well, have no worries. I'm Tracy Alexander and this is ILTV's Weekly Review. Well, no one is immune to the coronavirus as Israel's third, third largest city, Haifa, is now learning. As infection numbers surge around the country, the northern city, which has been largely untouched by COVID-19, could now be seeing their lucky streak come to an end with the number of active cases on the rise. This as Israel begins to clamp down on cities with high infection rates. Nittany Manson reports. The numbers are going up and the cities are being locked down. Cabinet ministers overnight approving new closures on neighborhoods in Lod and Ashdod, the latest hotspots for coronavirus infections to see shutdowns. All cities in lockdown will last for seven days. Traffic in and out will be limited along with opening of businesses, but each area will be given exact guidelines from the health ministry. As Israel logs its highest single day tally since the beginning of the pandemic. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Defense Minister Benny Gantz convening the coronavirus cabinet today to discuss tighter restrictions on gatherings. Netanyahu suggesting posting undercover police at weddings to ensure guests are following hygiene rules. And the controversial Shin Bet phone tracking scheme is back. The Israeli parliament approving new legislation overnight allowing the security service to trace the movement of COVID-19 carriers for the next three weeks until a more detailed bill is drafted. The death toll rising to 322 after another fatality Wednesday evening. Of the more than 26,000 cases since the pandemic start, more than 8,600 of them are active and some 58 in serious condition. The ultra-Orthodox city of Bnei Brak cordoning off one of its streets after dozens of yeshiva students were diagnosed with the virus. And this comes after a new report shows the rate of infections within the ultra-Orthodox community is double the rest of the population. And now yeshiva administrators hope to move their students to one of the government-run coronavirus quarantine hotels. And now the real hit to the hip pocket starting to show. Pushback has already begun as the finance ministry looks to cut billions of shekels from salaries and benefits in the public sector, reportedly to the tune of cutting some $13 billion from the state budget over three years, including lowering civil servant salaries by $2 billion. Minister Israel Katz is looking to find ways for the burden to be shared. It's been a day now since missing the deadline to begin Israeli expansion plans for Judea and Samaria, but the government's been talking about this for years, so missing the deadline hardly means giving up. Here's more. Down but not out. The Israeli Prime Minister might have missed the July 1 date that he'd been trying to hit to begin annexing parts of Judea and Samaria, but instead, just a statement from his office, saying talks with the United States over rolling out its peace plan will continue. From all angles, the settlers raising their voices. Prominent settlement heads like from the Yesha and Samaria regional councils calling out the Netanyahu Gantz government for being all talk with no walk. On the other hand, residents of the heavily populated Ariel settlement saying they don't care much for the plan at all and much prefer the status quo. Ariel is long discussed as the first or most likely settlement to be absorbed by Israel in any peace plan. Despite the anti-climax for settlers, though, Palestinians in and the West Bank still taking to the streets in a quote-unquote day of rage. The Palestinians have rejected Trump's peace plan out of hand. The leadership's ethos is to establish itself in Israel's stead. It's the time now to raise a red card for this Israeli government, which is trying to lead the whole world by the nose, rejecting all the voices coming either from Israel, inside Israel, from the Arabs, Muslims, Europe, everybody except Trump and his crazy administration. And to know that here in Palestine, still there is a partner. The same voice, the same commitment. 
Netanyahu's office, meanwhile, promising a series of meetings on the subject, including Israel's top security brass convening for additional discussions. And the Pope, the latest to try to promote dialogue, summoning the Israeli and U.S. ambassadors to the Vatican for meetings over the annexation plans. A big question for many is why this is even a question. How did this area in Judea and Samaria become disputed territory in the first place? So we've got some of that for you. Well, it's a long story, so sit back as we take you back to when the United Nations gave its partition plan recommendation in 1947. Israel was said to be given 56% of the land west of the Jordan River, which was mostly desert, to leave room for incoming immigrants. The local Arab populations were to receive some 43%, which included a third of the Mediterranean coastline and nearly all of the highlands in Judea and Samaria. Jerusalem, meanwhile, was said to be an international city. The Jews agreed to the plan, but the Arab world not only said no, they launched a war intent on eliminating all Jewish presence in the region, which completely voided the UN partition recommendation. Now, fighting between the Jews and Arabs in British mandatory Palestine continued until the British mandate expired in 1948, at which time Israel took the opportunity to declare its independence. Now, that's when five surrounding Arab armies invaded, the result of this war leaving the map looking like this, with Jordan controlling nearly all of what's today known as the West Bank, as it lies west of the Jordan River. Jordan also expelled all the Jews in the area. Egypt, meanwhile, took control over Gaza. Jerusalem was left divided into eastern and western halves along the lines where Israel stopped Jordan's military advance. Israel got everything in between, offering citizenship to all the Arabs who remained. Those who accepted it are today the Arab Israelis, making up over 20% of Israel's population. As for those who refused citizenship, the offer to them and their descendants still stands today. But I'm going to jump in here because the thing is that this quote-unquote border, which we know now as the Green Line, was just a ceasefire line. At the Arabs' insistence, it would not serve as a true and permanent border, leaving the territories essentially in dispute. Now fast forward to the 1967 Six Day War. Israel preemptively strikes Egypt, acting on intelligence of an imminent threat, as well as Egyptian acts of war in the Straits of Tehran. Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and even Iraq got involved in the war. The result saw Israeli territory expand across the rest of Jerusalem, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, the Sinai Peninsula, and the Golan Heights. Finally, to complicate things further as to who has rights to where, in 1988, Jordan officially gave up its claims to the West Bank and stripped all of the Palestinian Arabs of Jordanian citizenship. Now bear with us as we fast forward again to the 1990s and the signing of the Oslo Accords, an attempt by Israel under the leadership of Yitzhak Rabin and Shimon Peres to broker peace with the Palestinians under Yasser Arafat's leadership. This process created the Palestinian Authority and a framework for peace, but it collapsed and evolved into an approximately five-year surge of devastating terror attacks against Israelis known as the Second Intifada. Yet even within that period, there were renewed attempts at peace. The first, made by Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak, which the Palestinians rejected. Then attempt B by Premier Ariel Sharon came in 2005, where Sharon unilaterally pulled all Jewish settlements out of Gaza, leading to the violent Hamas takeover in 2007. Next, Prime Minister Ehud Olmert tried his hand in 2008-2009, but again, none of those offers were agreed to by the Palestinians. And finally, under Netanyahu in 2013-14, peace talks broke down again after Palestinian refusals to accept. Now, many critics are pointing to Israel's inflexibility on settlements in the Judea-Samaria region at the time although the Palestinians by then had a long history of rejecting negotiations for other reasons. A good question, and basically the answer amounts to timing. With the release of US President Donald Trump's Peace to Prosperity Plan in January this year, Israel was given a clear path to extending sovereignty over Israeli settlements across roughly 30% of Judea and Samaria. The thing is, President Trump is up for re-election this November. And if he doesn't win a second term in office, it's feared that support for this plan would disappear with his administration. So as they say, strike while the iron is hot. In short, it's complicated. Some of those in favor argue that Israel has every right to follow through on the Jews' historic, religious, and indigenous claims to the land. 
here on ILTV, Israel's major media watchdog, Honest Reporting, told us that some think that for the first time it causes the Palestinians to pay a price for not closing on a peace deal, and it pressures them to come and negotiate. The thinking here is that every time the Palestinians have said no to a deal, Israel comes back with a better offer, in essence, rewarding the PA's rejectionism. So now, Israel is trying to force their hand. And as we saw in his Washington Post op-ed, Israeli ambassador to the United States, Ron Dermer, said the move squashes the illusion that the Palestinians will be able to eradicate Israel in the future. Also, if you look at the current map, you'll see Jewish areas speckled amongst the Palestinian areas. Israelis who live there would like to see the Jewish Jewish areas joined for safety reasons and also to prevent their homes being absorbed in a future Palestinian state, the creation of which some in Israel's right wing take issue with in its entirety. But even among those who want to see annexations, some don't want to see it done in the way that Trump's plan envisions. Some say it would leave Israeli islands in Palestinian territory. Some argue that the security challenges would be too great and costly, and some say that it's just purely political pandering aimed at the Israeli right wing, and that it's not worth the cost in international and diplomatic penalties that may result. So that same old saying again, nine million people, nine billion opinions. And then there's the Israeli left, who oppose the move entirely, arguing that it would indefinitely extend Israel's occupation of the Palestinian people, and that the Palestinians would be left without a real path to self-determination. Now that word occupation, by the way, is disputed by Israelis who feel you can't occupy what is rightfully yours. But the term is used by Israel's Supreme Court in determining how Israel must behave in those areas. As for Prime Minister Netanyahu, in principle, he's expressed support for annexations from the beginning. But recently, his more centrist coalition partner, Benny Gantz, has also come to the conclusion that if the Palestinians aren't going to talk and haven't agreed to any deal to date, Israel has to push forward alone. Well, the Palestinians and many in the international community say no. The PA even goes so far as to accuse Israeli settlers of war crimes at the International Criminal Court for building in Judea and Samaria. And it's true that some annexations, like the unilateral taking of another country's sovereign land, is forbidden by international law. But the land in question is exactly that, in question. It's disputed territory that, under the Oslo Accords signed by the Palestinian leadership, would likely go to Israel anyway. So from the Israeli government's point of view, it's time to get the ball rolling. So technically, yes, extending sovereignty is annexation, but that doesn't make it illegal, immoral or evil by definition. There are three kinds of annexations. The first is unilateral annexations of sovereign land, like what Russia did in Crimea, and that is illegal under international law. The second is bilateral annexations of sovereign land, meaning that both sides agree to it, like what the US did with Texas and Hawaii, and this is perfectly fine. Finally, the third kind is unilateral annexations of land not officially controlled by any sovereign state, like what happened in the Cook Islands in 1900. And that's what Israel is planning to do in parts of the disputed West Bank region. Now this is the big question, and there are a number of different hypotheses. Here's the current map of the West Bank divided into areas A, B, and C. Area A is under the control of the Palestinian Authority as well as Palestinian security. Area B is where the Palestinian Authority presides over civil matters, but there's joined Israeli and Palestinian security efforts. And finally, Area C is where Israel is in charge of both security and civilian matters, as well as infrastructure. So now one misconception is that Israel is trying to annex the whole West Bank, therefore standing in the way of a potential future Palestinian state. But the population in areas Israel is looking to annex is already made up of an Israeli majority, and it's suspected they'll all be in Area C under Israeli jurisdiction. But the maps haven't come out yet. Plus, in Trump's deal, Israel gets just a fraction of what it expected to get under the Oslo Accords, which the Palestinians signed. So practically speaking, under the Trump outline, not much would actually change on the ground, except that some Palestinian communities could find themselves absorbed by Israel. And reports tell us that quite Quietly, some of those residents would actually be happy about this move, because they hope to gain Israeli citizenship. Also, as we said before, it changes the negotiating position, putting the ball in the Palestinian Authority's court to come to the table. So 72 years after the establishment of the state, we're looking at another shift in the narrative. July 1 will tell us in what direction it's beginning to head. 
I forget annexations or even the coronavirus. The topic on the minds of Israel's rabbinate is training women so that they can sit for the exams as Orthodox rabbis. The chief rabbinate of Israel is threatening to strike if it's forced to provide education to women who wish to study the laws required to become a rabbi under the Orthodox faith. Now, it comes after Attorney General Avichai Mandelblit last week told the Israeli High Court that the state will set up a parallel track allowing women to be tested on the same material as men who take the rabbinate exams. The idea of the training, though, is not to become a rabbi per se, but rather for the status and benefits that passing the exams can bring these women, like an increase in pay in certain positions or the ability to apply for a civil service position that otherwise they wouldn't have access to because some professions consider the rabbinical exams an equivalent to an academic degree. But the chief rabbinate is saying it's not an institute for higher education. Its role is to certify rabbis. Moving on now, effective immediately, the Israeli Defense Forces announcing today that compulsory military service for males will be shortened from 32 months to 30 months. It's part of a new law passed in 2016 that further cut mandatory service time for men, which was already slashed to 32 months in 2015 from 36. Women have to serve for 24 months unless they volunteer for a unit that requires additional service time. We move now to the latest with Israel's coronavirus crisis. The numbers continue to climb and the restrictions are seeping back in. Nitney Manson has all you need to know. All right, well, moving on now. How did Jerusalem deal with the tremendous destruction wrought upon her by the Babylonian army in the 6th century BCE? Well, a double stamp impression on a bulla and a seal made of reused pottery shards may provide an answer to this burning question. Here's more. I'm standing at the Givati parking lot excavations where the Israeli Antiquity Authority and Tel Aviv University are conducting archaeological excavations uh, for many years. Uh, it's part of the City of David National Park in Jerusalem. The two items that I'm holding in my hand, a bulla and a seal, are a major contribution to our understanding of the nature of Jerusalem during the Persian period, time of the returnees uh, to Jerusalem following the destruction. From a biblical account, we know that Jerusalem was completely destroyed at 586 BCE. And then when it was resettled, a, a wall was built around the city. But in the last 20 years, archaeologists and biblical scholars are debating what exactly was the nature of Jerusalem in those days. And the archaeological finds that are so scarce it led most of the scholars to think that Jerusalem was not an important city, was very small and scarcely inhabited. These two items that I hold in my hand are, as mentioned before, evidence to the relatively complex administration conducted here in Jerusalem during the Persian period. The first is a seal, a relatively big one, probably used to seal uh, containers as jars or something like that, and not uh, small items as letters. The second item is slightly more complex. This is a double seal, meaning it had two uh, stamps on it. Again, it's relatively big, uh, meaning it was used to seal probably a jar or another container. In the impression we can see a figure, probably a king, sitting on a big chair and a, a post uh, standing in front of him, most probably the symbol of one of the Babylonian gods, Nebu or Morach. These two items join other things that we found, like for example a large quantity of fish bones that tells us that people were eating here food that got from distant from the sea, far away places, and uh, pottery items that are, one of them has the face of a, a bess that tells us that there were connections between Jerusalem and the uh, uh, inhabitants of other uh, parts of the land. All right, now to start this next story, here's a quick riddle. What do you get when you cross the need for sustainable meal making with a Play-Doh-like extruder? I don't know, Aaron, what? Well, <laughs> check this out. <laughs> okay. Believe it or not, this is the future of the meat industry. In just an hour, this printer by Redefine Meat can build you about six and a half kilos or 13 pounds of fake meat. The idea is to replace a cow. So each of our machines produce in a day exactly like a cow, up to 250 kilos in a single day. And not just faux ground beef, as with other alternative meat products. As far as we know, there is an amazing industry of alternative meat that is focused on minced meat. And actually, the meat industry is driven by the whole muscle cuts. Our technology can create whole muscle cuts, just as a cow can produce that, in a much more efficient way, with a lower cost, and of course, it's much better for the environment. So we're introducing a new category, 
we can do the entire cow, not only one part of the cow that is actually side stream. Steaks, roast, slow cooking, grilling, everything that an animal can do, we want to do the same or even better. And best of all, it's part of a push to save the planet. This is the biggest problem we face today as humanity, and this is the best way to fight climate change, to deliver healthier solution and food to the entire population of the planet. Now moving out of the lab and into the kitchen, many restaurants and hungry restaurant goers are already showing interest. I think uh, 3D printed meat is a really great idea. As uh, soon as it will be, as soon as the taste will be as good as the regular meat, I will definitely move, try it. Using the 3D printer for making uh, food helps to um, protect the environment, protect the animals, protect by killing innocent, uh, innocent animals. That's good. I'm looking forward to try this. So how do they do it? Food engineer Alexei Tomzov lays it out. We analyze the different components that uh, make those beautiful cuts and try to figure out which are the key components that we need to mimic in order to achieve those beautiful cuts of meat. We identify three main components, the muscle, the blood and the fat. These are the components that we need to mimic in order to reach the perfect, beautiful steak. And using a soybean-based formula, the final product not only looks the part, but supposedly cooks and tastes like the real thing too. At the end of the day, technology is important, but what's more interesting is to have a really delicious and tasty food product that you can cut through and have a bite and be excited. Are you hungry, Tracy? I am. Plant-based meat will save the world, Aaron. I, I surely hope so, actually. <laughs> I really do. That's it for ILTV's Weekly Review. See you next week.